It's Wednesday Wonders, science fiction and fantasy on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated G for general audiences. Welcome to Chronosphere Fiction. This is your pilot, Daniel French. On this episode, we bring you something geared a little more towards our younger passengers. Writer Patricia Keeler brings you an adventure with an anxious rodent. This episode is part one of four in this story. So sit back and enjoy part one of Harry the Hamster Goes to Venice. On a leafy street in a windy town, there lived a very lucky man named Mark with his very lucky wife named Lucy. In fact, Mark and Lucy were so lucky that they lived in a huge house with great high ceilings and big wide rooms. Too many rooms to even count on both hands. One of these rooms was Mark and Lucy's bedroom, and in it, Mark kept a cage that was the home of his two pet hamsters, Harry and Pip. Both hamsters had beady black oil drop eyes, golden fleecy fur like honey-flavored candy floss, thought Mark, and were so alike in appearance that Lucy could hardly tell them apart. And yet, the two of them were so unlike in character that it was difficult to understand how they were ever friends at all. How unfair, said Harry one day, peering through the bars of his cage at the big wide room around him. How unfair that Mark and Lucy should have this whole lovely house to roam in, and we have only this cage. Oh, but what a very handsome cage it is, said Pip, who was laid on his back in a pillowy mound of sawdust, and Mark and Lucy are very kind. We have water to drink and food to eat. What more could uh, you possibly want, Harry? But it's all so boring. I want adventure. Don't you long for a bit of adventure, Pip? No, said Pip. I like my life just as it is. And with that, the little hamster yawned and stretched and nuzzled himself down into his bedding. And before Harry got the chance to say anything more... Pip was fast asleep. The next morning, when Pip and Harry awoke, there was an open suitcase on Mark and Lucy's bed, and the two of them were rushing around in their dressing gowns, trying to fill it. Have you got the passports? cried Lucy, digging through a chest of drawers. Got them, cried Mark, from inside the wardrobe. Have you got the sun cream? Oh, Mark and Lucy were really a lucky pair. If it wasn't enough to have this whole great house in which to fuss and frolic, they were now off on a trip to a completely different part of the world. A two-week holiday in Venice. Ah, Venice, said Harry to Pip, leaning through the bars of their cage to gaze at the open suitcases. Where they have canals instead of roads, and boats instead of cars. Think of the adventures we could have. Don't you just wish that we were going too? Why would I want to go to a place like that? A bit of dry sawdust to snuggle into is all a hamster needs. And a hamster wheel is quite enough adventure for me. Well, it's not for me, said Harry, who couldn't stand the piercing squeak the hamster wheel made when either he or Pip were in it. I tell you, Pip, we should sneak into Mark and Lucy's suitcase and have a two-week holiday in Venice ourselves. A holiday in Venice? (laughs) Have you gone completely mad, Harry? (laughs) Oh, no, 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 no. You won't find me doing anything like that. Besides, we can't even get out of our cage. 
Oh yes, we can. I've got a plan. Harry's plan was very simple, but very, very cunning indeed. Now, every time Mark went away from his great house to go on a holiday, which was three times a year, the lucky man, he always took his two hamsters out of their cage to kiss them one final goodbye before he left. Mark was a big man, but he was also a very soft and kind man, and he loved his two hamsters very much. And so when Mark, sobbing and blubbering like a baby, opened the cage door and lifted the two little rodents up in his hands, he did not notice that one of those hamsters sneaked up the sleeve of his jacket. Indeed, Mark was so overwhelmed by tears that when he put his hand back in the cage, he wasn't even aware that it was only Pip that jumped out. (laughs) Oh, poor Mark. He really was very upset. In fact was crying so much that when Harry scrambled right up to the shoulder of his sleeve, down underneath his vest, and then out through the leg hole of his trousers, he never once felt a thing. Completely undetected, Harry scampered across the floor, scaled the corner post of the bed, hopped off the pillow, and then buried himself deep down into Mark and Lucy's suitcase. And when Mark and Lucy opened the suitcase in their hotel room in Venice, neither of them spotted their little pet. Harry Hamster, climb out and scuttle away in search of adventure. Harry ran along the hotel corridor as fast as his little legs would carry him. He had no clue where he was or any idea where he was going, but this did not matter one tiny bit to Harry. All he'd known his whole life was a little cramped cage with no room hardly to walk in, but now he could feel all the marvelous space high and wide all around, and he ran and ran and ran. My word, how about this? cried Harry as he scuttled through the halls. I never knew my legs could move so fast. Harry zigzagged across the hall, sometimes skipping and sometimes jumping right up high into the air, laughing all the while. He'd never felt so free, and yet this freedom still wasn't enough. Yes, the ceilings were high in the hotel and the walls were wide, but they still formed a cage of sorts. What Harry wanted was to be able to look up and around and see nothing but the clear blue sky and the enormous distance to the horizon. He had to get outside. But he wasn't alone in the corridor. Lots of other very lucky people were also arriving in the hotel. They began their holidays and were all rushing around trying to find their rooms. They stomped back and forth along the hallway, wheeling great suitcases and clomping heavy feet. And Harry had to dodge and dart around them to save himself from being squished. But he kept on running, and soon Harry came to a staircase at the end of the corridor. Yes, Down the stairs and out to freedom. Down the steps he ran, and out across the hotel foyer on the bottom floor. There were people everywhere in the foyer, all rushing around in a fuss. Harry swerved between the scurrying legs of the excited children and ducked beneath the shiny brass frames of porter trolleys as they were wheeled along. What fun! What adventure I'm having already! Then he saw the revolving doors that led out of the hotel into the big, wide world. Round and round they spun, like the propellers of some great ship, and Harry ran straight for them. The doors swallowed Harry in one, and they spat him out the other side into the bright daylight of the Venice streets. Harry stopped running. In fact, he stopped moving altogether and just looked up and all around him. He could hardly believe it. There were no metal bars that encaged him, no walls that blinded him, no ceiling and no roof that covered him. No, for the first time in Harry's life, he was not only out of his cage, he was outside. Harry was free.
He looked again at his surroundings, carefully this time, taking everything in. And what he saw was the most impressive sight he had ever seen in his life. Huge, tall buildings, taller even than Mark and Lucy's lovely house back home, stretched high up towards a turquoise blue sky. Harry stood on his hind legs and arched his neck to look up as high as he could, and yet, even as he stepped backwards, he could still not see the tops of them. Then he looked to his left, down the canal, and then he looked right up and he realized neither could he see the building's ends. They were all so long and all joined together, and there was no telling where they begin or where they ended. Oh, Pip, said Harry, thinking of his friends stuck in their cage back home. You don't know what you're missing. <laughs> but below Harry, there was an even more astounding sight. Everything that Harry had heard was true. Instead of concrete roads and noisy rushing cars, there was a smooth and sleek canal that carried many beautiful wooden boats upon its surface. The boats were gondolas. They were painted black and were long and narrow like old-fashioned canoes. And they swanned elegantly along the canal without a sound. Each gondola was piloted by a gondolier with a single oar. All the gondoliers wore a stripy blue shirts, black trousers, straw hats, and red neckerchiefs. Harry stared at the men in their vessels in absolute awe. Wow, I think I found my adventure. I'm going to become a gondolier. But at that moment, there came an almighty screech over his shoulder, and Harry swung his head round to see a little gray mouse come bursting out of one of the buildings and make her way, sprinting towards Harry. Help! Help! Somebody help me! The little mouse screamed. What's wrong? Coming out of the same building and tearing hot on the little gray mouse's heels were three enormous cats. Oh my goodness! Help me! Help me! Come with me! Harry shouted and grabbed the little mouse by her paw. Harry had no idea where he was leading the mouse, but he gripped hold tight and ran faster than he'd ever run in his life. Hand in hand, they tore along the edge of the canal, whirring past the men in their gondolas, the cats gaining on them every second. We can't outrun them! I know. We're going to have to jump. Jump? But I can't swim! Just trust me, said Harry tightening his grip on the little mouse's paw, and before she could protest any further, Harry jumped. The two rodents hurtled through the air with the gray mouse's tail flailing behind them. Terrified of the water, the mouse scrunched her eyes tight shut and prepared herself for the splash. But the splash never came. Somehow, with a bump and a skid, they had managed to land on dry ground. It's okay. You can open your eyes now said Harry, who still kept hold of the little mouse's paw. We jumped onto a passing gondola. The cats have gone. We escaped. Escaped? said the little mouse, still in too much shock to really understand what she was hearing. Yes, look. To her amazement, she did indeed find herself sitting next to a mysterious hamster on the seat of one of the long and swan-like gondolas. For a moment, she appeared very impressed and she rubbed her little eyes in disbelief. But as she looked around, her eyes then fell on the gondolier, towering enormously over them, and she gave a little shriek and jumped down into the hole of the boat and hid beneath the seat. But the man, who was concentrating on steering his way down the canal, hadn't noticed the two little stowaways that had leapt aboard his boat. It's okay. You can come out now. We're safe. But who... Where did the cats go? They didn't go anywhere. They're still prowling along the edge of the canal. Cats are far too scared of water to risk jumping onto a gondola. Why don't you stand up and take a look for yourself? The little mouse stood and peered over the gondola's bow. Sure enough, the cats were still perched on the edge of the canal and were shaking in anger at these two little rodents who had managed to escape them. And when they saw the little mouse's eyes appear, they all hissed and scratched the air at her, and she shrank back down, out of sight. 
Don't worry. I can't reach you from here, said Harry to the mouse. Then he stood back and faced the cats on the shore. Cowards! Why don't you pick on things your own size? The cats only hissed once more in reply, and then, puffing out their chests and turning away with a flick of their tails, they slunk back down along the edge of the canal. Harry now tried once more to comfort the trembling mouse. My name's Harry the Hamster. What's yours? Topaz. Very pleased to meet you, Topaz. Who are those cats? They are very vicious. Their leader's name is Tomasina. She's the tortoise shell. And her two friends with the white fur are called Bianca and Polo. They chase us mice all over Venice. And when they catch us, they... Her voice trailed off. Thank you so much for saving me, Harry. It really was very brave of you. Harry blushed a faint beetroot color at Topaz's words. Oh, I didn't do anything, really. For a moment, neither of them said anything and just enjoyed a strange, floaty feeling that stirred in their bellies, which, for the moment, they both put down to being on a boat. Eventually, Topaz broke the silence. So, where are you from, Harry? Somewhere fast-paced and exotic, I guess? Oh, no, said Harry with a big shake of his head. I come from the most boring place in the whole wide world. But I have come to Venice in search of adventure. How exciting! What sort of adventure? Well, I've decided to become a gondolier. I'll build my own gondola and sail up and down these very canals, ferrying the Venetian mice all over the city, wherever they want to go. I'll make new friends and discover all sorts of adventures. That sounds wonderful. Perhaps you could take me out for a sail one day, once your boat is built and ready. Well, since you're the first friend I've made in Venice... I think it only fair that you should come out with me on my gondola's maiden voyage. It would be my pleasure. Just then, the big gondola they were presently aboard came to a stop, and the gondolier climbed ashore and tied the boat up to its mooring beside two bright red speedboats. Gosh, this is right outside the mouse palace where I live, said Topaz, standing to get out of the boat. They were moored up next to what Harry thought must have been the highest building in all of Venice. It looked like it was once a beautiful and opulent palace, but now it was rather rugged and weather-beaten. Dry bits of cream-colored paint, all jagged round the edges, were flaking in large chunks off the walls. All the windows were either cracked and smashed or just missing entirely. Nevertheless, it was still a very mighty and impressive structure. A huge wooden gate, twice as tall as Harry's owner, Mark, and studded all along its fixtures with shiny brass bolts, stood strongly, though fixed slightly ajar, at the palace's entrance. Above it, coats of arms were sculpted into hollows all over the face of the building, some in the shapes of angels looking out over canal and city, and others in the shapes of lions and eagles but even these were faded from the brilliant white that they once were, and most had patches of slimy green and yellow mold growing over them. But what struck Harry the most as he gazed up at the gigantic construction was the sheer size of the thing. It was enormous. It must have been as long as 20 gondolas and as high as 30 gondoliers. Wow, is this really where you live? Oh, yes. It's where all the Venetian mice live on this side of the canal. It's beautiful. You really are very lucky. Thank you, said Topaz, and she lowered her eyes slightly and looked down at her toes. Well, I've got to go now. It's been nice meeting you, Harry. And you, Topaz. The little mouse hopped onto the shore, but before she scuttled away, she turned back to Harry and said, Be sure to come back this way once you've built your gondola. I'll be looking out for you. Of course I will. And thank you for today. Harry wanted to say that it was no trouble at all, but before he had the chance, the little mouse had dashed away and disappeared through the gap in the giant gate. 
Harry climbed out of the gondola. My word, he said out loud as he skipped along the edge of the canal. What a very fine mouse I've made as my first friend here in Venice. I must start building my gondola right away. I can't wait to see Topaz again. I wouldn't count on it, hissed a voice behind him. You'll be lucky if you ever see the light of day again. Harry turned to confront the sound, and he was met face to face with a huge pair of green eyes and a snarling mouth of glistening white fangs. They belonged to a tortoise shell, to Tomasina. You can escape us once, said the cat, her hot breath beating over Harry's face. But this time you shall be lunch. Ah, uh, no I won't, said Harry, and he span round to sprint away. But as he turned, he was stopped in his tracks by Tomasina's two friends, Bianca and Polo, who had crowded round behind him. He was cornered on all sides. So guys, purred Tomasina to her companions, I'm getting hungry. Shall we start with his ears or his little stubby tail? The cats bore down on Harry all round. They peeled their lips off over their gums and snarled in his face. Long strings of saliva dangled from their teeth, and Harry could smell the hunger on their hot breaths. He shook. He was petrified, but he wasn't going to give up without a fight. Before he even knew what he was doing, Harry jumped up and grabbed Tomasina's whiskers with both paws and pulled down on them as hard as he could. The cat screamed. And as quick as a blink of the eyes, Harry sprinted beneath their legs and was scampering away down the edge of the canal before Tomasina even knew what had happened. Bianca and Polo tried to give chase, but both of them tripped over the fallen Tomasina, and all three cats got their legs tangled and tied up together like octopuses in a fishing net. Once again, Harry had escaped. Harry walked along the canal. He was completely alone, save for a few pigeons pecking at the crumbs between the cracks and the cobbles beneath their feet. The jet black gondolas skimmed gently below him, and the bright white balconies of the buildings shone like mountaintops in the afternoon sun. Yet Harry could not enjoy any of these sights. He was badly shaken by his ordeal with the cats, and he kept looking back over his shoulder as he walked. He wanted to start searching for some suitable materials with which to build his very own gondola. But he was too afraid to let his guard down for fear the cats might return. Harry continued anxiously along like this for some time, and in the end he became very tired and wanted to stop somewhere secluded and have a good rest. But not knowing the city of Venice at all, and having nowhere to go and no one to turn to, he could see no other option but to keep on walking and see what fortune brought along his path. It seemed, however, that Harry must have used up all of his good fortune for one day when he'd met the lovely little mouse Topaz, for what happened next was very unfortunate indeed. Harry had only been vaguely aware of the deep buzzing noise that was slowly approaching and growing louder from behind him. He was just too deeply lost in his worries, but now noise had risen to an almost deafening level, and Harry suddenly noticed that all the gondoliers had stood up in their boats and were waving their fists and shouting angrily. Slow down, you maniac, went the chorus of gondoliers. We'll be drowned. The buzzing was so loud now that the windows and all the buildings along the canal were shaking in their frames, and Harry could even feel the bones in his skeleton starting to tremble. The racket, of course, was being caused by one of those bright red speedboats that Harry had seen moored up outside the mouse palace where Topaz lived. Only now, it was no longer tied up and silent, but hurtling down the canal towards Harry at terrific speed. The scramble of the gondoliers was nothing short of chaotic. They gaped, they shrieked, they floundered, they panicked. 
They began rushing frantically to get their boats out of the way of this great approaching monster, but now the speedboat was almost upon them, and the men all began to abandon their gondolas. Some were close enough to jump up onto the shore, but most had no choice but to throw themselves straight into the water. The speedboat came mercilessly, crashing into the empty gondolas, sending oars and shards and splinters and planks flying in every direction, and went whooshing past Harry in a terrific blur of red. For a moment, Harry thought that he was very lucky, for not a single piece of shrapnel from the exploding gondolas came anywhere near him. But no sooner had he thought this than he looked back in the direction the speedboat had come from, and saw the most frightening thing he had ever seen in his life. A huge wave was rising high up from the canal in the speedboat's wake, and Harry knew that at any second it would come crashing down upon him. The gondoliers scattered, the pigeons flew off in a flap, but Harry could do nothing but stare aghast at the giant wave that was peeling along the shore towards him. Harry gaped at the wave, was frozen on the spot, and something within him began to scream out, Run! It told him, Run! Now! As fast as you can! If Harry hadn't listened to that voice, then there is no doubt he would have been drowned. But Harry did listen. He swiveled away from the wave and ran faster than he thought his legs were capable of running. Over the cobbles, faster and faster he ran, but the great wave gained on his little heels with every step, and then just as Harry began to feel the wet drops of spray flicking at the fur on his back, his eyes landed on the grate of a drain cover, and he immediately dived through it, clasping his front paws as tightly as he could to the grate. Harry dangled down beneath it as the great wave rolled over him, the drain flooded, and Harry had to hold his breath as he became submerged in water. But he didn't let go. And soon, the water drained away, and Harry pulled himself back up onto the surface to see the wave had passed and the danger was over. Soggy and shivering, Harry brushed himself down and shook the water out of his ears. He couldn't believe he was still alive. And indeed, he pinched himself to make sure. Sure enough, he was alive and well, but it soon dawned on him that he was still in the same predicament that he was in before, with nowhere to go, no one to turn to, only now. He was also cold and feeling absolutely beaten by his ordeal. And where am I going to sleep tonight? He wondered out loud to the open air. But what Harry didn't realize when he asked this question was that another little mouse was following him and that this mouse was listening. And that is part one of Harry the Hamster Goes to Venice. Written by Patricia Keeler. Your narrator and the voices of Pip, Mark, and Lucy is Blake Benley. The voices of Topaz and Thomasina are Kristen Curtis. Music by Andrew Manos and Daniel French at Fishbonius Sound Design. Production, mixing, editing, and sound design are by Daniel French at Fishbonia Sound Design. Keep an eye on Chronosphere Fiction for part two of Harry the Hamster Goes to Venice. Thank you for flying the Chronosphere. Until next time, keep your cosmos clean.
Do you like thrillers, action, adventure, mystery, crime drama? Well, you're in luck, because here on the Mutual Audio Network, we have Thursday Thrillers. You can subscribe and have a dose of adrenaline-pumping audio every Thursday from your favorite podcast player. Get it here now. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.